This video was originally recorded May 2018 at Tibet House US in New York City. To watch the full archive recording, please visit tibethouse.us. Uh, well, we had a nice evening last night, but we had no time for any kind of questions. So, <coughs> so hopefully today we won't just talk uh, the whole time, but we'll have some, some opportunity um, for, uh, for real dialogue. And I would just encourage everyone, um, if questions come up, if thoughts come up, or if, if you've come in with stuff that you want to talk about, but then you feel like, oh, I don't know, in public to raise something. Um, it's better to raise it in front of everybody than to come privately, uh, because anything that you're thinking about, it, it's not just yours. It's going to be relevant to other people here. And if, if you have the, um, uh, if, if you have the courage, yeah, I don't think they're coming. Uh, they're not coming. They're not coming, so those chairs are available. Um, if you have the courage, anyway, you know what I'm saying. Um, so, we're going to talk about um, facing the ego today in the, under the umbrella of uh, anxiety, addiction, and depression, moving towards uh, love, relief, and understanding. But the intermediate step in terms of dealing with our darker stuff uh, is to be able to look at ourselves, uh, at our own, uh, the complexity of our own uh, emotional experience, uh, our own histories, our, our own personal traumas, uh, to be able to look at that with um, a, a, the non-judgmental mind uh, that we learn about from Buddhist <coughs> teachers like Bob and Sharon, you know, who uh, are able to teach this age-old technique that begins with mindfulness, where we learn to, uh, to hold the complexity, the, the richness, and the, but the uh, sort of scariness, the horror, as I was saying last night, uh, where we can hold the horror of ourselves as well as the beauty of ourselves that we're not so in touch with, where we can hold all of that with the, with the same mind. So we were, Sharon and I were talking back there about um, uh, Eric Schneiderman a little bit and y you know, how, uh, um, how difficult it must be uh, for him and for us uh, to face y y you know, the, uh, the dark side. Uh, um, in his case of himself, uh, if the claims are true, and in, in our case, not to set him up as, uh, you know, an alien kind of figure, but to, to realize that what he's dealing with is, on some level, what we all have to deal with. Uh, maybe not on that level or with that kind of uh, acting out, but we all act out in some way or other. So, uh, I wrote a book some years ago called The Trauma of Everyday Life. Uh, that was inspired by um, a couple of things, but, but one, one major one was the fact that the Buddha's mother died uh, a week after he was born. And um, that was a, a fact that's kind of etched in stone. You know, all the, all the Buddhist statues that uh, before there was a lot of writing uh, told the story there. There she is giving birth to him. He give, she gives birth from her side. Uh, and then a week later she dies. Uh, but no one had ever made anything of this fact. Like why, if the story of the Buddha's life has, has some, uh, some truth, some mythological truth or some archetypical truth or some relevance, why does his mother die after, after a week? Uh, and I searched through all the Buddhist literature and, and um, 
Uh, there's hardly any mention of it, but I was intrigued by it. I thought, oh, this is like something that was waiting for the age of psychoanalysis, you know? <laughs> um, and I was, I was once on retreat in, in, at the Forest Refuge, which is um, uh, a, um, uh, a retreat facility at the Insight Meditation Society that's sort of uh, hidden behind the regular IMS, where you can go and do self-retreats. Uh, and there's a little library there that you're not supposed to go into because when you're, when you're uh, on retreat, you're not supposed to be reading or writing, but yet they have a library. Um, <laughs> so I would sneak into the library every night around 7 o'clock, and they have the whole Buddhist canon, which is like the uh, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, uh, uh, on one shelf. And one, one in the middle of my retreat, when I was first thinking about this, I, I picked one volume at random off the shelf and then opened it at random, and it was the only place in the entire uh, canon where they talk about the death of the Buddha's mother, and it just like opened up for me. Um, so, and what it says is, oh, don't worry, monks, uh, Buddha's mothers always die uh, a week after they're born, um, because if she were to live and to see him renounce his family at the age of 29 when he leaves everything and goes into the wilderness, it, it would break her heart. Uh, so rather than break her heart, they take her out. She has to die um, mercifully. She, she, uh, and then she watches from uh, the heaven realm. Uh, she watches him and helps him when, when he's uh, at his most uh, uh, self-punishing, most ascetic, most, most anorectic. Um, so I thought, oh, that's something of a rationalization. Um, uh, maybe there's another purpose for, for this. And that got me thinking about trauma and about all of our relationships with our mothers or with our fathers or with our, you know, whoever it is that we blame our predicament on. Um, because it seemed to me that there was a, a, an obvious trauma, an early trauma um, in... Uh, Psychoanalytic thought, we, they call it now, there's big T trauma, which is like what, you know, when, the, uh, when the earthquake comes or a terrorist comes or your partner has a heart attack in front of you or, you know, there's a, like a big T event that's trauma. But then there are these little T traumas uh, uh, that happen in childhood, um, which uh, um, my hero Winnicott calls the, the primitive agonies of childhood when that happened, especially w before the child has evolved a verbal capacity, a symbolic capacity to understand what's going on around them, where they, they have an emotional response, say, to being left alone for too long or to having one of the parents be, be drunk and you know, not paying attention to them, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, uh, a uh, young child has uh, intense emotions, they're all wired in, but they, they don't have the verbal, cognitive, symbolic capacity to understand it. They're completely dependent on the, their caretakers to hold them in the metaphorical sense and reassure them, explain to them, oh, it's okay, it'll be all right, I'm coming back, don't worry. That kind of holding uh, allows the um, intense emotional experience to be metabolized, to be digested, to be um, processed. And if there's not enough of that, then there's this early trauma that where the um, intense emotions have nowhere to go. So the idea, you know, the body-centered psychotherapies in California and so on would say that uh, the um, uh, unmetabolized emotions are held in the body. And uh, we know from... Uh, being around these uh, silent uh, Vipassana retreats that if you, uh, if you enter into these retreats that are silent where you're just watching your own experience, after a couple of days, early traumatic uh, experiences or the remnants of them or the peripheral elements of them tend to surface and people can be quite frightened, quite overwhelmed, right? Mm -hmm. This happens, it, it, it took the Vipassana teachers by surprise in the early years that uh, um, every retreat a couple of people would be just immersed in intense emotional ex uh, experiences that they 
couldn't really process, didn't have words for. So, and we see this in psychotherapy all the time. Uh, people come for reasons that are kind of murky, they don't quite know why they're there, but, uh, but in the, um, uh, over time, once the environment gets safe enough, uh, remnants of those early traumatic experiences emerge in one form or another, sometimes in the relationship to the therapist, which you know, Freud called transference, that uh, the, you know, the early dysfunction gets acted out uh, with a therapist. Sometimes it just comes up as in dreams or memories. Sometimes you, you, know, you can only infer or intuit, oh, maybe there was something, but, but we're all carrying uh, we're not all. Some of us are lucky enough not to be, but uh, uh, even the very um, uh, experience of being born uh, into a body and a mind and then growing into self-consciousness and having to reckon with, oh my God, you're my parents and this is, where, like, and this is my body and how am I supposed to navigate myself in this world, all kinds of anxieties. Uh, um, addictions and depressions uh, tend to come just by virtue of the mind uh, trying to make sense of itself. And that's what we tend to call the ego. Uh, the, the ego emerges uh, around the age of three or four when self-consciousness dawns. And the ego's primary function is to um, negotiate uh, one's, uh, one's way in the world. Uh, I read this thing last night from this new book by uh, Karl Ove Nausgaard where he's writing to his uh, three-month-old daughter and he says he realizes his main, as a 46-year-old, he realizes his life is parrying, uh, like in fencing, parrying all the, <coughs> all the um, assaults uh, that are coming his way, you know, work and love and uh, family and so on. So the ego is the parrying element. Uh, it, it negotiates, it mediates, you know, the, the inner instincts versus the outer uh, requirements that we be civilized. It, it, uh, it helps you deal with all the demands of uh, family and school and environment and so on. So without the ego, we would be lost. Um, so we can't just like give it up, then we become psychotic or um, uh, just act out our, <coughs> our addictions and so on. But the, the ego's main uh, uh, place of comfort is uh, when things are under control. So it's always seeking control and comfort and security. To do that it has to uh, be careful to uh, keep the intense emotional uh, um, uh, reactions that come with these kinds of, especially with these kinds of early traumas, uh, it has to keep them quiet, it has to keep them at bay. So the, the ego is all about, you know, staying in one piece, uh, not uh, going to pieces, you know, without falling apart. That's, that's something that we have to learn from, uh, from, from meditation. Uh, so if we can, and, and the the kind of meditation that allows us to go to pieces without falling apart, that allows us to metabolize or digest uh, the early emotional experiences that we are carrying but might not really understand, that, that kind of meditation is actually, I think, uh, another ego function. You know, we're, we're actually training our egos in <coughs> mi with mindfulness to be able to hold uh, uh, experiences that otherwise would be devastating, would, would, for, would make the ego, you know, fragment, which it doesn't want to do. So um, the, the training in mindfulness is gradually, you, you know, incrementally uh, desensitizing ourselves to that, with, that which is within us that we would otherwise run away from. So that, that's the idea of facing the ego uh, that I'm trying to talk about today. So uh, in, a, in addition, here he is. It's OK. I explained. 
Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. All I've talked about so far is, is the death of the Buddha's mother. The death of Buddha's mother? Death of Buddha's mother. I and know, I was trying to find the Avatamsaka Sutra about you, what she has to say herself about it. Exactly. But I, I, it's not in the library. I didn't bring it down with it, but never mind. I can you, you can, Please go ahead. You can channel it. Um, so I was using the death of the Buddha's mother as a metaphor for the, the early uh, primitive agonies that we all face by I virtue know. of the, uh, human, side the of human form and how we tend to blame, you know, we're always looking for someone or something to blame for our predicament. Yes. And either, as Sharon has written so beautifully in her book Faith, uh, either we blame ourselves, so we, we come up with, uh, you know, at around the age of nine or ten, uh, or in adolescence, or whenever it might be, we, we come up with the statement of the problem is me, and then we start to you know tear ourselves apart, either um, literally or metaphorically, in order to try to get rid of the offending element. Uh, or we, uh, as is more traditional in the world of psychoanalysis, we blame the, uh, uh, the parents. So the, the poor mother, uh, has been blamed oh, since the 50s when, when, um, when Winnicott, uh, as we talked about last night, talked about the good enough mother uh, you know, as a beautiful thing, uh, that the, the ordinary devoted mother, you, you know, through her own failures, repeatedly mends her failures with her child and thereby imbues a sense of faith in the child that even though there are failures, there will be solutions, and that, that love triumphs over aggression. That was Winnicott's major point. But that all got turned around so that uh, parents were feeling like they were never good enough and that they're, and they're struggling. You know, our generation of parents is trying to be perfect, per perfectly attentive, uh, and they're, thereby failing to establish you know, uh, enough boundaries and so on. Um, so there's no winning when your parents, but the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the tendency in uh, the 1950s psychoanalysis and the popular press there was just to turn it all around and blame the parents. So we're trying to solve that problem. Uh, so in addition to Winnicott, the, the uh, person who inspired me the most about this was uh, the musician and composer John Cage, who um, in 1951, uh, came to uh, classes at Columbia uh, that the uh, Japanese philosopher and uh, uh, Zen philosopher D.T. Suzuki gave. Uh, he gave classes for two years that a whole variety of uh, downtown intelligentsia uh, attended. John Cage, Philip Guston, uh, Agnes Martin, J.D. Salinger, Allen Ginsberg, um, Eric Frome, the psychoanalyst, Karen Horney. Um, uh, so Zen Buddhist philosophy infiltrated the, the culture uh, at that time. Before, I mean, through Eric Frome and, and uh, Karen Horney, it came in a little bit to the psychoanalytic world. But it came in especially to the art world. Uh, and uh, John Cage, who was not a meditator, he was a, a musician and a composer, but he really took the teachings uh, to heart and decided that he would uh, use what he learned from Suzuki in uh, the making of his own music. And uh, so he developed a way of uh, um, listening to sound, not differentiating the musical sounds from the non-musical sounds, but to use everything, the car noise and the uh, burglar alarms and uh, 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 Muzak uh, uh, it, as uh, a part of his music. Uh, and there's a wonderful, he was on uh, the TV show What's My Line once um, <laughs> in the late 1950s where uh, uh, he comes on, you could see, they had it in a retrospective of his work. Uh, he, he, he has a whole um, uh, symphony of kitchen utensils going at the uh, beginning of the show, like uh, electric blenders, all these, uh, uh, all these utensils from the 1950s, and he's, he's making a symphony out of, uh, out of all of this at the beginning of the TV show, and then they have to guess wh who he is. 
Um, so we're going to do a meditation uh, based on John Cage where the ambient sound is like a uh, stand-in for all the difficult memories, the difficult <laughs> emotional experiences, uh, uh, and also the beauty, because sometimes the sound you, you know, really is musical, even if it's not melodic. Um, uh, so I'm going to ask you to uh, take out your cell phones which, uh, and uh, turn them on <laughs> so that they'll, um, they'll beep or ring or something if you get an email or a text. You just go to settings. You know how to do it? Yes. You, yes. Not everybody does. You go to settings and then to uh, sounds and haptics on mine and turn the volume up. <laughs> so it, it's still early on a Saturday morning. I don't think it'll be too noisy because we're not, we're not that in demand. Okay, so we'll do maybe, maybe 10 minutes. 10 minutes will seem long. <clears throat> we can find our meditative posture. The seats, these seats are relatively comfortable. They're not that comfortable, but allow yourself to feel supported by your chair. Let your eyes close if you're comfortable that way. If you need to keep them open, if you want to keep them open, that's fine. Let them just gaze downward with your eyes a little bit half closed. And let yourself first feel the places where your body touches the floor, where your body touches the chair, where gravity is kind of holding you. Your seat in your seat, your seat as your throne, your body as your refuge. And then let your mind relax into your body the way you're letting your body relax into your seat. And rather than meditating in any way that you normally do, just uh, let the centerpiece of the meditation be the ambient sound. So situate, situate your attention rather than at the tip of your nose or your belly, situate it at what we call in Buddhist psychology the ear door. Where the sounds meet the body. And try to just follow the sound over time. Let it wash through you, carry you, however you want to think about it. Noticing when your mind interrupts the flow of the sound to comment or identify. The mind interrupting is like the ego, you know, trying, wanting to make sense out of things. So 
Just notice it, but come back to the sound.
that there's, there's some kind of lesson there that if, even when we turn the cell phones on, that, that it's still silent. We don't have to be, we don't have to keep that, the parts of ourselves that we're afraid of, we don't have to keep it all t turned <laughs> off, <laughs> locked away. <coughs> I like to start with that meditation because it sort of takes it takes the, um, the there's a stri there can be a striving quality to meditation or when when we for me anyway when we start with l watching the breath like it can be difficult to find the breath and the, and a lot of people feel like oh they're never doing it right um, like like or they're they're straining I've noticed that. M uh, myself, like, like I feel like, oh, I can't quite find it, and am I, uh, uh, am I doing it right, you know? Uh, but with the sound, like, you just have to um, settle back into yourself in order to listen in 360 degrees. So I think the, the effortless effort that's required in meditation, sometimes you can find it a little bit better when you back off of the technique uh, a little. What, one of my last retreats um, at the Forest Refuge, I, uh, I was locked into that, oh, I'm not quite doing it right, there's something wrong with me as a meditator kind of thing. And the, um, uh, the, the, the instructor there, who I, I had one 10-minute interview with, um, said something to me like, uh, uh, don't chase her, let her find you, uh, in, my, in my little interview. And I, he was a German, uh, an ex-German monk, and I thought I wasn't hearing him quite right. Like, why was he gendering it like that? Don't, don't chase her, let her find you. But, that, but then, I, then I realized there's this, there's this yearning Sharon was talking about it last night. There's a, a yearning that brings us to meditation often, where we're you know feeling incomplete and looking to, looking for wholeness, uh, that we often eroticize uh, a little bit. Even in even sitting alone, watching our breath, we're reaching for some vaguely erotic uh, uh, something, uh, or I do. Um, uh, and he knew that and then gendered it that way on purpose, you know, cause, and that went so, um, and I actually had the experience uh, some days later of sitting in the dining hall drinking, drinking my tea uh, and the, not even trying, then the sensation of my breath came very, very like, you know, cool and silky and beautiful like right there, and at first I didn't even know what it was, but it had, it was, you know, it had, it had come from nowhere, which is, I think, the, um, uh, the reassuring experience that can happen in meditation where something beautiful comes out of nowhere, it, you know, when we, we think we're just sitting with the horror of ourselves, but, but uh, uh, then some moment of grace. It's quite an advertisement. <laughs> come to the Insight Meditation Society. Sit with the horror Sit with the horror of yourself. <laughs> Two days, three days, seven days, nine day options available. It would be. And you pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> but it, it's relatively inexpensive compared to. Uh, <laughs> um, so, are there any are there any thoughts or questions at at this point before I turn the stage over? Yeah. I don't know if we have a microphone for you. Um, we also don't have Tashi in the room. But I'll repeat the question. Yeah. So earlier you were talking about the ego. And from a, a psychotherapy standpoint, is the ego different than the Buddhist interpretation of the ego? The question's about the ego. Earlier I was talking about the ego. From a psychotherapeutic standpoint, is the ego that the psychotherapists are talking about, is that the same or different than the ego that the Buddhists are talking about? Um, I have struggled with this question from the beginning of my struggling with questions. Um, I think that I think it's I think they're the same. Uh, now I think they're the same. Um, you, as I was saying earlier, you, you know, the ego is a necessary construction. 
it, it, com it comes into being w with the dawning of consciousness and of the intellect, where the, within ourselves we're trying to make sense of our experience, and, uh, and we need an ego to do that. The, the, um, the problem from the Buddhist point of view, and, and Bob is very eloquent about this, uh, is, that we, is that we invest that ego with a kind of uh, solidity uh, that it doesn't need to have. You, you know, even from the psychoanalytic point of view, the ego is a construction. It's a, it's a necessary uh, imagined thing, but it's not a real thing. But, but we, in our, in our need to feel secure in ourselves, invest that construction with an ultimate reality that then makes us feel more isolated, more alone. We, within, we're already feeling alone, because we, where did this all come from? You know? um, but it makes us feel more alone in our efforts to feel you know, uh, more, more secure than we can feel in a world that is impermanent and, and uh, you know, that we can't ultimately control. So the, the, the Buddhist um, view of the ego is not to get rid of it, it's to see its relational nature. It's to see its lack of ultimate reality. Uh, Bob was saying last night, you know, when, uh, about this question about the soul, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. You, you know, so the, the ego is both real and not real. That would be the, that would be, we, we need it, but we don't need to uh, see it as, as so real. Um, uh, and so that kind of fle flexibility, that gets you into the words like flexibility, fluidity, pli pliability, uh, an ego that can both melt, you know, in love, in, in contact, in creative uh, experience, in music, uh, and, and an ego that can then come back when we need to, you know, take out the garbage or uh, um, write a paper or something, you know. Um, so that, that gives room for both the, the, the uh, psychoanalytic, psychodynamic necessity of the ego. Our friend Jack Engler years ago, uh, trying to make sense of all this, uh, had a, a statement, you know, you have to be somebody before you can be nobody. That, uh, that which, and then we all disagreed with that because uh, um, people with, who don't have really a, a, a good enough psychoanalytic ego, uh, who are still wrestling with primitive agonies, come to meditation with an incomplete ego, and meditation can help you with your incomplete ego by not uh, by encouraging you not to try to make it so complete, you, you know, but just by leave, leave it alone. You could have an incomplete ego and still function. It's ego enough, you know. Um, so. <laughs> So I think they're basically all, both trying to talk about the same thing with completely different language, you, you know. Um, uh, but coming out of an internal exploration, I think if you read Freud, Winnicott, and so on, uh, the, by looking carefully at the ego, what they see eventually is the ego's um, relational nature the ego's need to inflate itself or deflate itself in order to find some kind of coherence. And, uh, and we don't need that coherence. Or there's another kind of coherence that comes from the Buddhist side that, that uh, uh, raises it uh, a, a level and lets us look down on ourselves and see how we're embedded in something much more uh, uh, complicated uh, 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 much more grand than we uh, normally think of ourselves. Can, can, can I add something? Uh, definitely. There's a, you're making, reminding me of something very interesting, I think. That is can you hear him? Interesting to add here at this, in regard to that. Um, Dzongkhapa, the great Dzongkhapa, 14th, 15th century, a great uh, Tibetan um, scholar and uh, yogi and so on, um, he has an amazing thing where he says that there are three types of, of experience. And, um, and one of them is the experience of things as if they really exist, as if they exist as things in themselves, so to speak, like with an absolute kind of quality about them or essence, okay? And then there's the experience of things as if they absolutely do not exist. 
and as if they completely don't exist. You know, that they disappear, and that seems to be their absolute condition. And that, is, that can be an experience. And then the third one is the experience of things without any intense sense of their either existing or not existing. Okay, those are three, he calls them like experiential habits or perceptual habits. And then surprisingly, he says, how many of those habits does an unenlightened person have? And how many of those habits does an enlightened person have? And he says, the unenlightened person has the experience of things as absolutely existing, and some sort of things, experience of things as if they are not, neither absolutely existing or not existing. They have those two. And the enlightened person has all three. So the enlightened person has the experience of things as if they absolutely exist, <coughs> the experience of them as if they absolutely don't exist, and then the unqualified experience. And then he doesn't, he has to elaborate consequences of having those three habits versus those two habits, which are, you know, he's, he, which have to do with sort of spiritual interpretation or the interpretation of spiritual experience, which is too complicated a little bit. But what is fascinating to me when I encountered that after years of whatever, is that that means that, in a way, the only way to really discover the relationality and the constructedness of the self or the ego, which of course is just a pronoun. If, you know, ego, the, the guy who translated Freud into English took the German word I, ich, and translated it as the Greek ego to make it sound more technical in English. <laughs> Because if we just said the I, you know, people would think, oh, well, that's just a pronoun. But that's all it was. That's all it is, is a pronoun. And Buddhism agrees with that. But the point is that you will med people meditate, and they will have a big experience, which will be a relief experience, where everything seems to disappear. And all of themselves and the world, and the, and the horror of the opposition of themselves and the world, both things seem to dissolve in that experience. And then they will report, they'll have a eureka moment, from that after they recover and um, stagger down to the dining hall from the meditation center. And they will say, Eureka, I achieved, a, I, I realized selflessness or I realized emptiness or I'm enlightened or something. And the, unfortunately, they will be stuck on the non existence and they will think that state is the state of enlightenment. But in, actually, according to him, it's, the, it's having somehow a, a encompass an experience of what they think is real balanced with, oh no, it disappears completely and therefore is really not real, and having both of those as real experience, and somehow that flattens out the sense of self so that one can truly see it as a relational thing and be responsible for the constructing of it, actually, and then reshape it. So I think that's just, a, just it fits with, it's, a, it's actually an advanced, very complicated thing, mm -hmm. but it fits very simply yeah, with you what you're you saying. You just explained it very well. Isn't it? That's one of and the best I ever heard you explain. And the key there is to beware, as a meditator, of, of reifying the experience yeah. of everything mm -hmm. disappearing, yeah. of a moment of relief, as if that was the result. That's what you're looking for. That's that nihilistic interpretation mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Buddhism. And that's what I think in Zen, I speculate that that's what they mean when they say that so-and-so is trapped in the demon ghost cave of thinking he or she, usually he in Chinese history, <laughs> is enlightened and then behave badly because they have a real non-existence about whatever they do, so they don't care what they do, they become utterly reckless, such people, okay? I think, I think there's something similar in therapy, Bob. Hmm? Like, do you, like when, when uh, traumatic, early traumatic stuff that has never been talked about when it comes up, like, and it's and it's um, conversed about, you know, when it's held mm -hmm. in the room and talked about, that it that both its it, its reality, you know, the way it's been, the way it seems totally real, but then also in the way that it's being talked about, just as oh, it 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 happened, but it's not here now, uh -huh. you, you know, it's both its reality and its unreality are mm -hmm. being held at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so that's that thing you were just talking about, about it flattening out so that it loses its complete power. I think there's something similar happening. Isn't that, that's fun, isn't it's it? Good, it is. <coughs> we spoke of Ram Dass yesterday. And I was at a workshop with him years ago where a woman stood up 
and asked him whether or not she should get married. And she went on at length about why she should get married and at equal length of why she should not get married. And when she finally stopped, Ram Dass said, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> and addiction are all caught up in the story I'm telling myself about myself, which I think that kind of attachment is where the suffering really is. It's, it's, a, it's a thing in here, it's not a thing out there. And in segueing to the love and acceptance part and knowing that it doesn't matter which way I go, is just such freedom when I can be in that place. Could you could you all hear the latter part? No, that could no, no, I don't um, think so. You heard the first part. Um, she was saying the the key thing uh, for her experience is the um, uh, on the anxiety, addiction, and depression side. The story that she's repeating to herself about herself seems to be caught up in those uh, in those aspects. Uh, at, but that when um, when she moves away from that, is that what, when she moves away from that, uh, uh, from repeating the story, that there's some sense of freedom. Is that fair? When I say way into the love and acceptance part, it doesn't matter what the story is. It doesn't. It doesn't matter what the story is when uh, uh, that. Lets oh, well, her, that's what Ram Dass was saying. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I'm. I. I'm not sure she's uh, agreeing. Uh, um, as a psychotherapist, uh, where a lot of my time is spent trying to get the story that people are telling themselves out of their, uh, out of the privacy of their subjective <clears throat> selves and into the relationality of the psychotherapy, uh, uh, I, I would say that the, the, the ability to express it uh, without judgment is what frees you from it. Um, so that so we, we you know there's a tendency to want to leapfrog over the story as as if we as if we really can do that, but that you know this idea of the way out is through uh, a, applies there. So the the Ram Dass thing of it doesn't matter if you get married you get the marriage uh, lessons if you don't get married you get the not married lessons. There are real lessons there to be gotten on either, either side. Either direction, that, he said. That, either direction is a real lesson. Either direction, you, yeah. you, you have to go. <laughs> You can look back, but don't stare. Yeah, that. Yeah. Well, staring. I'm very good at staring. Um, my, I had a therapist who uh, uh, caught me in that, where where I was so uh, so needing to make contact with him that I would stare, uh, and uh, you know, to the point where he would be like, "Blink, would you?" Because <laughs> there was a, a fear of uh, going back into myself. Uh, you, you know, so you can you can fall over yourself on any side of all of, all of this. But, yeah. So, uh, Mark, last night you said something which really uh, touched me in a very profound way, which was, um, you know, uh, it, it it was that side of ourselves that always is, always was, and always will be forever young. Sort of, you know, the soft, uh, gentle side right. of ourselves. And I was so touched by it because, you know, understanding that and then the transition point in terms of, uh, you know, when we leave this body. Uh, and I'm wondering from the viewpoint of ego and from the viewpoint of self, uh, which, you know, always seems to be, always seems very real, but yet you can't put your finger on it, you know, you can't touch it. Um, is that what we're coming back to? Is that what we're coming home to, uh, in terms of our sit, in terms of our understanding, our, our giving ourselves a hug and giving ourselves some love in the process of our mindfulness meditation? Could you all hear? No. 
No. Uh, he said he was touched by something I was saying last night about um, uh, becoming uh, once again young, soft, open, and uh, uh, vulnerable, and unsure about everything that I that I know. Uh, I was quoting somebody else saying that. Uh, but uh, he was saying, is that what we, and I used that to then talk about, talking to my father about dying, and that's the place to uh, take refuge, uh, you know, as you're going through the, the death process. He's saying, is that what we're coming back to when we're meditating? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, or the, 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 the underlying question was something like, is that the ultimate place that we're coming to? So I would be a little reluctant to say that it, that, that, that we know what the ultimate place is, uh, other than what we learn from from uh, uh, Dr. Bob. Uh, um, but I think that I think for sure it's one. That's one aspect of something. That's one. Whether it's just about, uh, you know, I think it's it's easy to uh, think that not knowing is everything, but it, but it's hard. You know, you can't really build a case uh, not, on just not knowing. Um, but, but I well, think not from me, excuse me, but it's not my assurance, it's Buddha's assurance. Go, go the ahead third say, noble say. truth is, is what he said was what was real. Yes, Nirvana. but how would Bliss. you so what? Don't lay it on me. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm just still hoping well, that bli- he I was believe, correct. Yes, I'm hoping that you're, I like the idea of bliss as... Uh, well, 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 Buddha said he discovered it. That's yes, yeah, well, and they support. tend to hide the, like the... What? Don't, they, they tend to hide the uh, uh, orgasmic nature of his description. Yeah, well, right? that, that's because everybody's too scared of that, and they would have arrested him. And, but yeah. not in India, but late, he perhaps noticed later on. Yeah, especially some more the, uptight people. I think India, they were a little bit more relaxed. Uh-huh. So I, 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 I think to be a little unsure, in terms of not knowing, to, even to be a little unsure about what the... Uh, what it actually looks like, but to have, to to reach toward you know to infer it a little bit. Yes, we we know more when we get outside of our intellects. Sometimes, yeah. I'm just thinking of the word dissociation, and it came to me like way back when, but here just now. But she, I, I know. Just, she said she's thinking of the word dissociation that it came to her a little while ago which is interesting to me because I wanted to talk about dissociation but didn't in relationship to trauma. That what, what, what the ego does when it's faced with trauma, either early emotional primitive agony, little t trauma, or big, you know, like uh, something horrible that happens that you witness, what the ego does to protect itself, to stop itself from fragmenting, is to dissociate. So, it, so we dissociate actually we, you don't even have to call it the ego. We, I dissociate in response to something I can't handle. You know, in order to keep myself together, I push away what I can't handle to some place where I don't have to look at it. You, you know, put it in a closet, put it in a corner, put it in uh, underneath. But it, uh, we are we are so made that it won't stay uh, uh, hidden forever. Either we feel compelled to act out. Uh, but we don't know what we're doing. It's dissociated, and but it, and then it comes through us into our addictions, into our actions. The thing I read last night about the anorectic poet, where she thought she was doing it on purpose, but realized it was happening outside of her control. That's a dissociated thing that's then coming back, or um, uh, or we go on retreat, thinking that we're going to reach, uh, you know. Uh, some kind of bliss, and instead what we find are the dissociated, horrible uh, uh, elements of ourselves that we're, as, as Sharon already described so beautifully, we're, that we're paying uh, to re-experience, or to experience for the first time. Yeah, d- uh, dissociation seems to be uh, the major ego defense that, of relevance. There are others, but yeah. Arise in those moments? How do you use that in your 
uh, the, the questions about using mindfulness uh, as a treatment for trauma. A meditation practice. Using meditation practice, like how to, w in terms of um, uh, when or how to apply the technique actually, or to, in to help people use uh, meditation to deal with buried traumatic uh, um, aspects of themselves. Um, and as an example, I, I've been um, exposed to uh, trying to help survivors of an intimate partner violence, and I, when I try to kind of imagine how to use those techniques, it seems almost inappropriate to use it. Yeah. Because you know, counterproductive, that wouldn't be painful. So I was struggling with a question when I know this is so beneficial, but when will be appropriate? Yeah, yeah. How? Uh, she said she's been, she works sometimes with uh, survivors of intimate uh, uh, domestic abuse, and it almost feels inappropriate sometimes to try to um, impose uh, meditation on, uh, on those people in, as they're starting to come to terms with what they've experienced. Um, I have a couple of things to say about that. Uh, it, it, uh, 13 years ago, a, um, a woman came to see me in my office who had been in the tsunami in 2004. And uh, she had lost, uh, she'd been on vacation at, a, uh, at an eco uh, a hotel with her, uh, uh, sh uh, with her husband and her two children and her parents. And the tsunami came and washed everything away. And uh, everybody died but her. She, they all got caught in the, in the water. And she w surfaced and reached up and held onto a tree. And um, she lived. And, and her children died. And her husband died. And her parents died. Um, and, uh, and she ended up a year later. And somehow, uh, although she, she lived in London, she ended up in New York and uh, in my office. And. Um, and I was like, oh no, what, you know, like, what, how am I going to be of any help here? Uh, and I certainly wasn't going to teach her to meditate uh, right then. You know, that would have been, as you're saying, would have felt uh, uh, any way that I would have had of teaching her to meditate uh, would have felt inappropriate. Meditation would have not been inappropriate necessarily. Uh, but she actually was from Sri Lanka and had grown up Buddhist, but then uh, uh, moved to, uh, to England and gone to Cambridge. And you know, it was like the way we go to Sunday school. She had been raised Buddhist, so it didn't seem so relevant until then. But anyway, all I had to, all I had to go on with her was oh, she had two children, and I had two children, and I knew what it was to have two children. And in my office, it didn't, it didn't really matter right then if her children were alive or dead because it was just us in the office. So I just wanted to know about her children. Um, and so I made her talk to me about her children. You know, I asked her about her children. It had been the dissociation that came with trauma you know, was so like immediate that she hadn't even been back to the house in London that they had you know, left on vacation. She couldn't even know any, any thing that reminded her at all of, uh, of all the losses was too uh, frightening. But in the, secu in the privacy and security and, you know, just like the base my basement office, I could get her to talk about her children. And, um, and then over the years, I, got, I could get her to talk about everything, you know, so that she wasn't uh, uh, dissociated from the life that she had had before, you know, she, there was a through line, which was her, between uh, uh, what had come before and what was, to, what was still present and future, you know? And so uh, I, had to, um, I had to make the meditation uh, alive in the relationship. So rather than teaching it as a technique, I, I had to uh, bring it into conversation. Uh, and I think that's the, uh, I'm, the way mindfulness has swept into the psychotherapy world and almost for young therapists coming up, they, they want to learn to be mindfulness-based therapists rather than psychodynamically-based therapists. And I'm all for that because it's another 
um, it's, a, it's a great influence on the, the, the psychotherapy world needed uh, another energy coming in to reinvigorate it. But the, um, to be too locked into the technique, the way we learn it on retreat, trying to apply it in therapy is to miss uh, the relational nature of therapy and uh, all the knowledge that built up over, you know, in the psychodynamic uh, uh, tradition. So there's an integration that is just at the beginning of happening and it's up to all of us who are in that field to, to try to make that integration and I don't think it's been, you know, I think we're all just trying to figure it out. Uh, but the, the way of attending uh, incrementally to that which frightens us you, you know, if, if we're on a retreat, if you go to Sharon or Joseph or uh, Jack or any good meditation teacher uh, and you're having trouble, we, you know, there's, there's uh, stuff coming up that's difficult, they're not going to tell you to go, you know, sit there and face the wall and don't move until you've uh, worked through it all. They're going to tell you, do a little bit, come back to the breath, go, for, go to the dining hall, Go, you know, take a walk, come back, sit, face it a little bit more, you, you know, t do, stay a little bit longer with what you think you can't handle, but don't, uh, don't overdo it. I mean, Sharon, you, we, I can let Sharon talk for herself, mm -hmm. but, but I think that, that that way of gradually desensitizing yourself to yourself uh, it applies in both worlds. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's absolutely true, and I also... Um I don't know if this dynamic figures much in the psychotherapeutic relationship, but I've, I've not uncommonly found in a retreat context that people don't like that suggestion. Oh, which you know, suggestion? That, uh, take a break, take, take uh, a walk, oh, that's you know. Like, I, I kind of, I mean, I'd always, in a way, knew it. It was very much reinforced for me when I had uh, one teacher who ironically was like an extremely tough, tough, demanding, intense teacher um, named Sayadaw Upandita we had brought over from Burma in 1984, never having met him, but having heard he was a really great teacher. And, and he was a great teacher, and he was also extremely tough and demanding. I mean, really, a lot. Uh, and uh, one day he was in the meditation hall, um, and doing a question and answer session, and somebody asked him, how long should I pay attention to physical pain before I move my attention to something that's easier? And physical pain in this context is like a template for emotional pain or you know, any, any kind of difficulty like that. How long should I just be with it before I move my attention to something that's easier? Listening to sound in the context of meditation or something else in your body that isn't so painful or maybe loving kindness, something like that. And I thought, given his personality, he was going to say, you should be with the pain until you fall over. <laughs> I really did. It's like one of his favorite things to say was, it's noble to die while doing intensive retreat. <laughs> wow. like, really? You know, like, OK, you know. Um, I mean, he was a tough cookie. And he went on to say, uh, it's not wrong to like be with the pain, but you'll get exhausted. You'll get you feel overwhelmed. Why not build in balance all along the way, right? That's the goal. It's not to endure uh, or to just suffer. The goal is to be different with, right? To sort of pick up that reservoir of presence and balance and the holding container, which is different. So he said, don't be with it for very long. And I was sitting there, and I, I mean, I was so shocked. I thought. Wow, if those words are coming out of his mouth, it must really be true. Because he was like the furthest thing in the universe from someone who'd say something just to be nice. You know, <laughs> like never. But, and so that really became a theme of understanding as we uh, were working with different people. And I have found it's a pretty unpopular suggestion. Mm. You know, you think I can't do the real thing. You mm. think I'm a coward. You think I, you know. And, the corollary instruction, which is equally unpopular, uh, when we do loving kindness meditation and we go through a sequence of those we offer loving kindness to, beginning with ourselves and someone we uh, really respect and are grateful for, and we move through till we get to a difficult person. 
uh, the suggestion is that we not start with the most unthinkable person who has hurt us so badly that it's just, it would be unthinkable, or who is behaving or has behaved so, in our eyes, despicably on the world stage, it's just unimaginable. They say, start with someone you have a little bit of conflict with. It's like strength training, you know? You slowly make your way over. Uh, because we're building up an embodied understanding all along the way. Like, what could it mean to have, say, compassion for someone else and for yourself at the same time, or have compassion for someone and realize, I can't fix this. This is not in my hands. Or have compassion for someone and, and realize, I disagree so strongly, I'm just going to fight, you know? Um, it, it's like built up over time. But, I find people don't like to hear that either. <laughs> you know, in this very room, I've offered that instruction. Uh, and you know, uh, as a, in a single session of meditation instruction, and uh, then we sit, and I ring the bell, and the first question is, well, I tried to offer loving kindness to Hitler, and it didn't really work. And I'm like, <laughs> didn't I just say, you know, like, <laughs> Maybe don't do that, you know? <laughs> but I find that interesting. There's something in us that wants to like, yeah. be the hero, you know, or break through. Or... So in uh, speaking of Upandita, do you remember the story that you tell about when you were on retreat with him and you were, and you were feeling all the sadness coming up? Yeah. Would, yeah. You, would you? Sure. Because I, it, it's, it's related, although a little different. Yeah, it's a little bit different. <coughs> so I had never met him before we invited him. And he appeared, and then we uh, entered a three-month retreat under his guidance the next day. You know, and here he is, like, and we always had a really good relationship, and uh, he helped me a lot. Somehow his um, insistence, like, try harder, and you know, all of that translated in my mind to, oh, he believes in me. <laughs> you know, he believes I can do it. But still, you know, I'd never met him before. And um, not too long before he had come, a friend of mine had died in a very tragic way, and uh, I was feeling it, you know, as I was sitting there. And we were seeing Upandita six days a week for these very short meetings, just to describe our meditation practice and get some feedback. So I was really reluctant to talk about my friend and what I was feeling, and that I didn't even know him. He's a monk, you know. Um, and, but six days a week, you kind of finally have to say what your experience is, you know? <laughs> so I told him, I said, you know, I have a friend who died and I'm thinking about him. And, uh, I'm, and he said, are you really sad? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm really sad. And he said, are you crying? And I thought, oh, I shouldn't, you know. Like, and, and I said, just a little bit. <laughs> and he kind of shook his head and he said, every time you cry, you should cry your heart out. So that way you'll get the best release. And again, I was like totally shocked. You know, really? Like it's okay? You know, and, and that was the uh, yeah. that was the message. I love that. Coming from a Theravada monk. Yeah, yeah. 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 Should we get the microphone? Is there is there one? Well there was yesterday. Can you somebody get Tashi and just ask him? In the Gabby, you wanna? Wait, L Lily's taking care of the microphone. While we wait, I can be really loud. Okay. Uh, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to get this out well, but smart folks. Um, the, the through line that you were describing, I mean, you talk about the Sassafari movement, the tsunami seems kind of propulsive, but um, when, when, when you're used to spending time in the melted ego state, and thank you. And well, um, you know that that's fruitful and beautiful. When you're used to spending time in the melted ego state. Yes, yeah. when, you, when you've when you had enough experience with that and yeah. um, some accessibility and capability, I'm, I find it then hard to ever trust the more fixed ego state, yeah. except for when it has me in its grips and I'm in a state of anxiety or yeah. fury. Um, so, I'm, I'm lucky enough to spend a lot of time in that melted ego state, I think, but 
it renders me sort of paralyzed in, in the taking out the garbage and the writing the paper needs of life um, unless it's extreme, you know? Yeah. So I, the, that balance and that through line Obviously, meditation, but I'd love to hear you guys talk about it. Well, I, th I think that's not, um, that's not an uncommon issue, especially in, um, uh, in people who are more of a caretaker. Um, the melted ego state doesn't just come out of taking care of other people, uh, you know, out of, but it can, and it does a lot. It could come in creative work and, and through drugs or, or whatever. Um, but I find as a therapist, a lot of people who are very good at giving up the ego, feeling, you know, empathically relating to what's going on with another, giving them, y yielding, surrendering themselves and so on, to, um, to, for them to be honest about what their own needs are, uh, is much more difficult. And, uh, and then to be assertive with people they care about, their children or their spouses or their parents, for them to be assertive uh, about you, you know boundaries or about what's right for them uh, can also can be equally difficult. And th those are uh, we would call them ego functions. You, you know, like you need an ego to be able to do that. But even a bodhisattva. Uh, would be would uh, would have to have that ability to be able oh, sure. to uh, uh, know what's right for the other. You, you know, one of, one of the great things about Winnicott, for instance, is to is that he says that for a child growing up, uh, it's a child needs a mother, in, in his language, to be able to say when she can't handle the child anymore. That the, the mother being able to say that's enough it creates in the child the ability to have an empathic relationship with another, to see the other as a real other, you know, who needs their love and concern. That if, if you, as an enabler, as a caretaker, is only about like laying down in front of the other and being, you know, taken advantage of then the, the child, in this case, or the spouse, or whomever it is, never, doesn't ha isn't given the opportunity to learn uh, about real empathy, uh, which is that we all have limits, you know, and we have to take care of each other, and we have to be able to feel that. So even, even for the benefit of others, one has to learn to uh, be in touch with oneself. Uh, so I think, um, you could, people can use meditation to avoid doing that because mm -hmm. it's so easy once you get used to meditating, you can just keep surrendering, 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 so you can reinforce that uh, wonderful capacity that we all have. Um, so I don't think it's a, I don't, I don't think meditation necessarily teaches you that, but a good teacher like uh, Sharon is describing Upandita, who's saying, you know, like, pay attention to yourself you know, learn your limits, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, be in your own experience, take a break when you need to, you know, cry your heart out when you need to. Uh, that's telling you you take yourself seriously as well as taking the other seriously. And, you know, can you simultaneously have compassion for both self mm -hmm. and other? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that you're not real and the other person is real, it's that both of you are simultaneously real and unreal, et cetera, et cetera. You understand what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, a good psychotherapy might be very helpful at reinforcing that, a, you know, a good meditation teacher could equally, they're not really two separate uh, uh, entities. Uh, but it's important, it's really important. I think the microphone's probably right behind you. Oh, no, you have it. Right. Hello and thank you. Uh, today, um, there's a very popular book out by Christine Courtois called Complex Trauma, and its subtitle is, It's Not What You Did, It's What Was Done to You. And it can be a very helpful framework. 
you know, for people who've been extremely damaged and uh, suffer from all of the uh, low self-esteem and self-responsibility and blame. But yet at the same time to me it seems sort of dualistic. And when I think about it from a Buddhist frame of reference, I'm thinking about ripening black karma, for instance, and that it cannot be, it's what's w only what was done to you, although that has to be acknowledged. Uh, and so what you're saying about disassociation, of course, stirs up a lot of thinking on my part about this. So could you comment on that, please? You want me to comment on it? I do, how you would see it in terms um, of the role of ripening I, I black karma that. and self-responsibility while <coughs> in the throes of terrible damage done. Yeah, well the, the title of the book that you're quoting, you, you know, it's not what you did, it's what was done to you. Um, so many people are locked into thinking that it's what they did that brought the abuse uh, upon them. So anything that <laughs> counters uh, the uh, narrative, the false narrative that one has established about oneself is helpful. So that, so that title, which you know, flips it for a lot of people, couldn't be more helpful. Uh, at the same time, as we've been talking about a lot already, the need to blame <coughs> Um, is um, uh, very strong. So once it gets established as a, uh, as a cliche, it's not what you did, it's what was done to you, then, then we're just blaming the other. Um, so obviously that, that can't be the, um, the final place either, although it's very necessary often to be able to relieve oneself of the burden of, uh, oh, the problem is me. Um, uh, so we're we're looking we're looking for something, you know, a little more uh, unclear. Uh, which, that's why I like the death of the Buddha's mother uh, uh, metaphor, because he could have said, "Oh, the problem was her," you, you know, but. Um, in, in my retelling of the Buddha's story, he eventually comes to finding that, that maternal quality that he thought was lost, he finds it within his own experience. And he's able to redeploy it, you know. So uh, the lost mother, you know, is rediscovered as a, one, as a capacity that was there all the time within himself. So then, uh, then he's gone beyond blame, you, you know, just to, and, and in a way my story about the, my patient who lost everyone, the, the, the journey with her was sort of similar, that yes, of course she lost everyone, but the, there was a kind of reclamation that happened through uh, all, of our, uh, all of our discussions where uh, uh, the, you know, whatever, all those loved beings had brought out in her, uh, although they were gone, the, um, those qualities that, they, that she grew into through them was, is still present, and she was able to acknowledge that. So I think that, you know, that's, that's uh, a nice vision. Do you guys want to talk any? Uh, no, I mean, you said yeah. something about karma in there. Was that part of your question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think <clears throat> there are lots of means by which people come to a place, I guess, in effect, where we say, well, what now? You know, this is actually true, which is a journey in itself to acknowledge the truth of, yes, that terrible thing happened. And um, I was actually once at... Uh, it was some early anniversary of 9-11. I was in the Washington um, Cathedral, the National Cathedral, and the Dalai Lama was speaking uh, as in some, you know, obviously commemorative address about 9-11. About and he said something that on the face of it was extremely simple and kind of obvious, but upon reflection was very profound. He said, it happened. 
And that was it. It was the statement. It's like, it happened. And I thought, of course it happened. We know it happened, right? <laughs> but when I really took it in, it's like, oh, that happened, right? Like that, every element of that happened. Uh, that's a journey in itself. But then we come to what now, right? And for some people, um, I guess with a certain uh, faith tradition, a certain belief system, you'd say, well, that's God's will. That was God's will. Like, what now? How do I translate that into my everyday life? How do I metabolize that experience? Uh, for other people, you know, maybe they would say, well, this was my karma. This happened, you know. Um, but we don't really tend to understand karma anyway. You know, we think it's the same as blaming yourself or, um, you know, so these are very intricate questions. And uh, I've just come to see that people can use that um, in a way toward good, you know, if they have a deeper understanding or toward ill, like it was my fault, which is not the point. Um, and for one thing, in, uh, in the Buddhist cosmology, you know, we've all died and been reborn many, 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 many times. So, like, since time has no beginning, the universe has no beginning. And so those of us here in this room right now have all done everything, right? We've all done everything to one another and with one another, and we've saved one another, and we've really hurt one another. And so I've often thought from that perspective, the single most illogical feeling to have is one of self-righteousness. Like I, who am so perfect and immaculate way over here, I'm looking at you who did that terrible thing over there, which I could never ever do, because guess what? You've done it. You know, and uh, that doesn't mean you don't know right from wrong and you don't, you know, take strong action, uh, but it's coming from a different sense of self and other right there. And so, uh, and of course, not everyone shares that worldview by any means. So if you don't, I think there are other ways of coming to that same kind of understanding. I've long said I wanted someone to invent a machine that could uh, make audible people's thoughts, yeah. you know, so that we could plug in. It wouldn't exactly be a volunteer, one conscript per sitting. We'd make someone per sitting get plugged in so we could all sit and listen to what they were thinking, <laughs> you know. It would be so, maybe that's what the psychotherapeutic office is like, you know. But it's, it would be kind of amazing, I think. Like, wow, you looked so peaceful. <laughs> yeah. Who would have guessed? <laughs> like, really? You know, in the absence of that, I've, I've said, well, maybe we should have one person per sitting who we, we say, OK, you follow through every impulse that comes up in your mind, and we're just going to sit here and watch. It'd be an interesting <laughs> hour, wouldn't it? You know, like, oh, look at that. Um, you know, so there's some feeling about uh, action that's shared, you know, rather than, you know, mine, you know, my fault in some way. So that, that belief is held in a very different way than we imagine it to be. If, if, if I could yeah. add to that, I'm not sure I understand the, the question. <laughs> was I about, is that a book that was said, it's not what was done to me, but it was, it was not yeah. my fault, but it was what other people did? Yeah. So that's a very practical idea of people are too guilt-ridden. But uh, I just have to say that the Buddhist practice about having to do with karma is that a victim empowers themselves if they do take responsibility for what happens to them, actually. The opposite. It's actually the opposite. And it is not that, um, you know, you then, you know, you just sort of internalize some bad behavior and you don't try to, like, correct the other person or reflect back to them how they're behaving. But actually, and that, that helps the situation and helps the other person if you do that. But to help yourself, what they call the practice of turning adversity into an advantage involves taking responsibility yourself for having been there, for being the presence who, who invited the victimization in some way, which seems very extreme, and it's very against uh, the thing is to blame others you know, who were injured and say, oh, it's all your fault for some other person to do that. But for you yourself to take responsibility that somehow I must have liked the blade wheel of mind reform or mind transformation, famous work by Atisha's teacher, Dharma Rakshita, 
there's a whole long thing about anything bad that happens to you, it's because you did such and such in a previous life, and therefore you welcome it having happened to you. It's almost like masochism. You welcome it having happened to you, and you're going to rise above it, you're going to use it, the energy of that injury, to develop, uh, to rise into a place where you are beyond injury. And you're going to be able to absorb whatever it is, and you become, you, were, you develop what they call the armor of tolerance or patience and so on. And this way you develop your self spirituality. Because when you are responsible, whatever, whatever tiny fragment of responsibility you can find in yourself, that's something you can do something about. Sometimes you can't punish the evildoer, you can't do anything about that. And just more you blame the others, the less powerful and the more powerless you become, actually. So there is a completely opposite. I mean, you did already say that in your answer, that you don't want to get rigidly stuck on everybody else's fault. But the, there is a more intense way of, of uh, working with that, which is the real embrace of, of karma. And karma doesn't mean somebody did so, that some god did it to you. It's very hard for Westerners because they always have the feeling of this bigger power lurking behind there that's after them, uh, because they're, we were raised like that in the West. And um, you know, if if you're a secularist, it's the government or something. <laughs> it's the bad president or something. And often it is the bad president. And so <laughs> get out there, get out there and vote against that person. But the fact that it's happening to you. You're more powerful if you want to use that to develop yourself in some way. And if you're only looking at the faults of others, you will not be able to develop yourself well. So that is a really powerful thing. And the realistic, what, what they call, which the first branch, I just let me say, the first branch of the Eightfold Path of finding wholeness and wellness is not meditation. And, you know, in, in some situation of someone who received real injury, you, you said, well, I would never tell that person just to meditate because they were meditating on, their, on the terrible misery of their laws. So you don't want to intensify that. But the first branch is realistic. People say right, which I don't like, because that's, again, following a rule, you're right or wrong. But realistic worldview. Where, and, the, and the essence of the realistic worldview is not some religious blind faith thing. It is the responsible acceptance of causation and your embeddedness in causation, beginninglessly and endlessly. And then in that situation, when you accept, true acceptance of causation means how do you look at how yourself to exercise your choice and yourself, how do you strengthen yourself, in other words, right? So that sometimes accept means even if on an objective thing you are not to blame in some situation, if you say, I was there in front of that injurer and somehow I must have injured them or somebody or somehow this is doing, bringing this back to me, so now I'm going to use it to not injure anybody else, develop a, a being that won't injure anybody else and, that will, and then be more invulnerable um, to such injury. There, so that's, that's a challenge to us. However, I realize it is a challenge. Blame the victim when you are the victim can sometimes strengthen you as a victim. It's a kind of insight like that. I know it's kind of awful. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> it's like really horrible. It's so nice to put it all off on others. So I actually would like to sort of follow up um, with Dr. Thurman's resp uh, response to that. It sounds like what you're describing is dependent or origination. Or, but maybe you're not, and that's just one of those Buddhist concepts that I've never really quite understood very well. And if you could speak to that, what was that? I, I Depen could you describe dependent origination? The what? Dependent origination. Oh, dependent origination. Well, dependent origination is um, basically it comes down to that every bad thing comes from ignorance rather than from evil. So the root cause of anything evil, even, is ignorance, not understanding what things are. And um, uh, that's basically what it means. And of course, it also, it ha it, it, you can also simply translate it as relativity, relationality. The real emphasis is not on the origination. It's on the origination is almost catering to people's sense that there is some big source of something, which people have. but. Um, you know, the, the, in the higher levels of Buddhist science, they talk about dependent non-origination, or mutual dependency is really, so the word pratitya 
one thing going back on another. Because if you analyze the causation of anything, you will lose track of it, because the, the chain of causation is beginningless. So uh, the relativity part of it, the dependency part of it, or the relationality part of it, is the key part of it. And um, you know, if you go back to you know, what's, what's the cause of suffering? What's the cause of this and that? You know, it's ignorance. But that means that it's unreal. The suffering is, in some sense, unreal. Because I, I think it's there, I think it's bad because I'm, I don't understand its true nature. I misknow it. And also, ignorance doesn't just mean I don't know something, it means I'm wrongly knowing something. I'm misknowing. So we do, there is a word misknowledge, which is I prefer. It's in the English dictionary, but it fell out of use. I don't know why. Because people think when they know things, they really know them. I guess they don't, they don't like the word to you. You can misunderstand, but actually, you can also misknow. So. Uh, that everything that's the source, then that puts you in a situation of having to question yourself and question what you think. And then that automatically makes you, needs you practice mindfulness. If I'm, if what, well, my whole situation here is because I don't, I have a wrong idea of what's going on here, then I can find that source of my suffering in my wrong understanding. And also it's very encouraging because it means that if you come to have understanding, a knowledge, which wisdom is a knowledge. Wisdom is not some mystic resignation to things, or some mystical not knowing of things. It's knowing their nature. And if you come to know that, you will be happy, is the idea. So this is the opposite of a lot of our slogans. Or isn't, don't we have a favorite one, ignorance is bliss? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? That means, like, I didn't know I was going 90 miles an hour, officer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I should be in bliss. I was blissfully going 90 miles an hour. I didn't know it was 50 miles an hour was the, uh, the speed limit. <laughs> but apparently, that doesn't help you not get a ticket. Or if you ran into something, not get killed. So, so Buddha's thing is, no, ignorance is suffering. That's the source of it. And knowledge is bliss. And that's implying, not me, it's not Bob, not Dr. Bob saying it, it's Dr. Buddha saying it. If you know what these things are, you will be in bliss. You'll be free, of, or you'll be in relief. You know, he was a little more cautious. Right? He eventually said bliss. Mm -hmm. um. so, so, so that's, uh, that's uh, dependent origination. You know? And it said that 12 links of the... Then he made it very... You know, he made 12 links. He drew a 12-spoke uh, wheel. I'll and it starts... Uh, the, the final product is death. Old age and death is the 12th one. And then it goes back round the wheel to igno ignorance. Okay, so that that was the one thing. That supposedly, once he was enlightened, that was the only thing he wrote. Buddha, he drew in the sand. It's twelve spoke wheel. Hmm. <coughs> and it has all kind of name and form and lust and greed and hatred and things. They're all in there. And uh, but the root of it is misknowing, misunderstanding. Because we all think we know everything, right? We do. We have a misplaced confidence in our sense of what we know. Right? Therefore, people even think they know they're going to be nothing. They know it's all nothing. They know that. That's total psychotic, actually. <laughs> so I'm also going to respond okay? to that. That's great. Thank you. Oh, good. I'm also going to respond now that we've left what? realizing that we're psychotic half the time. Um, uh -huh. I'll respond to that, and then we thought maybe we'd take a break. Is that okay? You can hang in there a few okay. more minutes. And then, um, oh, wait, are we, is and then we'll have lunch around 1 o'clock. Oh, not till 1. Okay, fine. Is that okay? Right. Are you starving? <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, so I had been thinking of this earlier, um, because I don't normally think of the, con the construct of ego in terms of kind of melted or soft or, or rigid. I more think about... Um, uh, individuated, uh, and then an extreme of that maybe is reified. But I also think about relational or, or contextual. So the way I was taught it is like you can look at a tree, which I'm doing right now, uh, and you can see a seemingly singular entity there. It's just a tree. Or you can look at the tree and also sense the soil, which is nourishing it, and everything that's affecting the quality of that soil, which is, say, the rainfall. 
and everything that affects the quality of the rainfall, which we now know, you know, is pretty broad array of conditions that feed into that. So you can also look at the tree and see a network, right? You can see connection and interconnection to all these different elements. So as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, it, you know, last time I saw him, he was in uh, New York City, he held up a sunflower, and he said, look at all the non-sunflower elements in the sunflower. The sun itself, right? So that has something of the flavor of uh, dependent origination. You know, that it, there is a way of, uh, I don't think, uh, parsing, but just sensing. There, there are links, there's connection. Or my favorite um, reflection, which I often ask people to do, I can't believe I haven't asked you to do it yet. Um, it, we can do it right now. Uh, just as you sit here for a moment, think of everyone who has played a role, any role at all, in your being here in this room right now. Because presumably nobody was just walking down 15th Street, right? And decided to turn in here. Mm -hmm. We're here because of conversations that we had and interactions. Somebody gave us a book. Somebody told us about their meditation practice. So who all comes to mind? And sometimes I do this reflection and I talk about the Board of Regents of the state of New York, which gave me a scholarship, which is how I was able to go to college, which is how I ended up in India, was through this, this school program. Because they're part of why I'm sitting here right now. And sometimes I do this reflection and I think about those people whose actions have really hurt me. Not just the ones that I find annoying, you know, but those times I felt looking at my life, I have got to make a change or I won't be free because they're a part of why I'm sitting here right now as well. Right, we're here as just us and also as part of this fabric of life, of connection, conversation, interaction, influence, contingency. You know, that's the, the flavor, the nature of, of looking at uh, interconnection and the means described is, is dependent origination. Um, it's sort of the answer to, it's a response to, why isn't there just nothing? If there's no substance, there's, no, uh, there's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing that's unchanging. Well, this is why. Um, and the active arc, the most active arc in my training was a set of links with independent origination, which is contact, feeling, craving. You know, that we are in contact a sense door and a sense object every moment of our experience. Our eye is seeing a, an image or we're hearing a sound or so. Um, and every one of those moments of our experience is said to have a feeling tone, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. That's kind of part of, it's so quick that it's, uh, it's really kind of almost a part of the package that, that will be there. And we, re we react to that feeling tone. You know, that's what's encapsulated in craving. We hold on just out of habit to that which we find pleasant. We push away that which we find unpleasant. We kind of numb out to that which we find neutral. You know, we space out. Um, and it's right there that mindfulness is said to be most active because we have the possibility of being with pleasure and joy and delight very differently than our normal habit might dictate. And we have the possibility of being with pain very differently. You know, instead of uh, hatred and fear and isolation and uh, blaming, and, you know, and all of that, we have the possibility of, of utilizing that moment 
for greater presence and sense of connection with others and compassion and so on. And even with very kind of neutral, ordinary, in between moments where we most tend to space out, you know, and just wait for something better to happen, we have the possibility of actually being alive and, and connected. So that's the definition of mindfulness, is being with our experience in the moment without adding, holding on, pushing away, or, or delusion in this case, meaning that kind of numbing. And um, so it's right there that uh, again and again, the emphasis from, you know, taking from uh, dependent origination is kind of brought into practice. Of, of insight meditation anyway, you know, very strongly. So and I, you know, I actually, uh, I hope you all before the end of the day uh, or you come back have a chance to really look carefully at the exhibit because it's absolutely beautiful. And I remember sitting here once um, teaching and uh, using, I did an out loud greed meditation or grasping meditation. Uh, <laughs> Because I, I could see this, in that case, it was, a, it was a Tonka wall hanging right up in that wall. I couldn't see the price tag, but I could see it, uh, the, the Tonka. So this was my meditation. Um, I, that is so beautiful. I want that. <laughs> right, I have to buy it. I'm going to buy it. And then um, what ensued, as I was you know, saying this out loud, is what we often do when we get lost in craving or wanting. OK, I forgot that at that point I was living in a sublet, uh, which was extremely tiny. It was like a, a mini place. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't allowed to put anything on the walls. So I looked at this thing and I said, I've got to move. <laughs> uh, because, and while I move, I'm going to get a bigger apartment. Because if I have a bigger apartment, it's like the wall hanging can have its own room, and I can get lights and do it right, and I can have my own room. And then I thought, well, you know, to have an even bigger apartment in New York, I'm going to have to pay more rent. And if I have to pay more rent, I'm never going to be able to be in New York because I'm going to have to be traveling all the time and teaching. And you know, and I thought that's okay. I'll never see my wall hanging. <laughs> I'll never be in New York, but I'll own it. <laughs> OK, so that was my out loud meditation on <coughs> craving. And we could do that for everything, right? Still, that doesn't negate the moment of like, wow, that's beautiful. Right? It's just taking it in some weird direction. So OK, we're going to take a break. Come back quickly, OK? Well, in this last session for a little while, then we're going to meditate for a little while. But I'm going to read something from a book which I did translate from Tibetan and actually compared subsequently to Sanskrit, original. And, uh, and uh, well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Sebastian. And, um, but it isn't me, it's a sutra. That means it's from the Buddha, according to Mahayana Buddhists. According to Mahayana Buddhists, we don't agree with the Western historical thing that Pali Buddhism is the original Buddhism. The Pali suttas were not written for about 700 years or so after Buddha's life. They were held by memory. And they certainly are originally taught by Buddha. But also the Mahayana was also taught originally by Buddha, according to Mahayana Buddhists. <laughs> it wasn't like some later monks got bored and then forged a bunch of sutras and said that Buddha taught them, which is the rude thing that Western historical people say, which, which is, I think, rather rude to all kinds of really very very magnificent and marvelous Indian human beings. <clears throat> so, so this is from Buddha, no, it's not from me. I'm not the one who's going around assuring everybody of bliss. <laughs> and not only am I not doing it, but I'm, I think equally as miserable as almost everybody else. <laughs> and um, if not more so, my, my wife calls me a Buddha-holic. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> And my son has a nickname for me. He calls me, my dad's name is Bob Get a Life Thurman. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm, it's not about my assurance, it's on the Buddha. Anyway, I'm going to read from the beginning of the Vimalakirti Sutra, as it's called, which in this book, at the time of this book, I called the Holy Teaching of Vimalakirti, 
But the word Arya, which is what I translated as holy, should really, I think, better nowadays, I think, should be translated as noble. It's the same word as in the noble truth. And I was, I was tired of noble in those days, 40 years ago, and I translated it as holy, which is not wrong, but it's, it's just the wrong emphasis. So it tells the story of Vimalakirti was a lay person in, uh, in a city of, called Vaishali, which was like a very prosperous city in Buddha's time, like in New York or you know, um, Los Angeles or Chicago, a really, like, really wealthy city. And he used to travel there and teach near, near there. And um, at one time the Buddha was there, and, but he was staying outside, um, camped in a garden of a lady who was something like a m Elizabeth Taylor or something of the, of the era. She was a cour courtesan, which was a much more glorious thing than just a bordello uh, in, the, in, that, in that country at that time. And she also had an excellent chariot and faster horses than the mayor did. So when Buddha is coming there walking with his monks, the people who liked him and wanted to sponsor him, they would have compete to see whose house he would stay in. And the mayor wanted him to stay in City Hall, you know, for the center of the town, but he didn't have such a fast set of horses as the Amrapali was the name of the lady, the movie star, and she beat him there, and the Buddha would always accept the first invitation. He would, he, he would know comparison. If it was a hut somewhere, he would accept that, if that person asked him first. And so he was staying in the garden of Amrapali. He didn't stay in a house, but he stayed in the garden. So it's sort of like the Dalai Lama spending time in Malibu or something. So the mayor and the, and the elders of the city were annoyed. That, well, this holy man, you know, this, this intelligent holy person has spurned our invitation, so we're not going to go study with him. So. <coughs> Sorry, they, <coughs> they were boycotting him. But some young people came out to see him, and 500 of them, supposedly, and they brought, um, and there's a lot of things which I will read a little bit, but uh, there are names of, of a huge assembly that were there. And also when the Buddha taught, the gods would also show up. Don't ever believe that Buddhists are atheists. There's tons of gods in the Buddhist cosmos, uh, but there's just no one big boss, that's all. This, they just don't have a creator. They don't have one person they can blame <laughs> who, who did it all to us. Uh, they, they, and, the, and the god of the time asks, you know, supports the Buddha because the Buddha tells people that he didn't make them suffer. So they, they're, therefore, he likes the Buddha to tell people not to be angry when bad things happen to them. So anyway, so it, it introduces the Buddha with a big assembly of humans and gods and even some dragons and all kinds of creatures. And then they say, the Lord Buddha... The Bhagavan Buddha, though surrounded and venerated by these multitudes of many hundreds of thousands of living beings, sat upon a majestic lion throne and began to teach the Dharma, dominating all the multitudes just as Sumeru, the king of mountains, like Mount Everest, looms high over the oceans. The Lord Buddha shone, radiated, and glittered as he sat upon his magnificent lion throne. Thereupon the Lichavi, but then these young, five young, hundred young yuppi, yuppies come out from Vaishali who are going to go and study something with the Buddha against their elders who are boycotting him because they don't mind that he's staying in Malibu and, uh, or in Westchester or whatever. Uh, and um, they, they all have these parasols against the Indian sun which are jewel encrusted like pearls and things because they're all very wealthy. And they bring them and then they donate the parasols to the Buddha and the Sangha. And they make a big pile of these jeweled parasols in front of the Buddha. And they bow and they circulate him clockwise seven times, lay down the precious parasol and offering, and then they withdrew to one side and sit in order to ask a question. So as soon as all these precious parasols had been laid down, suddenly, by the miraculous power of the Bhagavan, uh, Lord Buddha, they were transformed into a single precious canopy, so great, that it formed a covering for this entire billion world galaxy. The surface of the entire billion world galaxy was reflected in the interior of the great precious canopy, where the total content of this galaxy could be seen. Limitless mansions of suns, moons, and stellar bodies, 
the realms of the gods, dragons, goblins, fairies, titans, eagle men, um, centaurs, and great serpent beings, as well as the realms of the four great kings of the quarters, the king of mountains, all, etc., all the great oceans, rivers, bays, torrents, streams, brooks, and springs. Finally, all the villages, suburbs, cities, capitals, provinces, and wildernesses. All this could be clearly seen by everyone. And the voices of all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions could be heard proclaiming their teachings of the Dharma in all the worlds, the sounds reverberating in the space beneath the great precious canopy. So he performs a kind of piece of performance art. And when I was commissioned to translate this sutra f almost 50 years ago, uh, when this, in the, like the fourth page, I could, what is this? I was like, <laughs> what? You know, it takes a pile of jeweled parasols and makes a giant canopy. And then the, it was very complicated to try to explain because it involved other universes. Because in the Buddhist view from that time, there were also many, many other humanoid universes. And you know, this idea of looking for one other intelligent being, of us a little lonely, tiny little planet Earth, and like the modern cosmology, was completely not sensible. There are many, many human universes, they, they felt. Not all of these are reflected, anyway, in this thing. <clears throat> so he showed... So then I finally decided what he did was created a temporary planetarium. And then in the planetarium, people saw the interconnectedness of all nature. So that was the first sort of miraculous piece of performance art that he created. And, you know, however people want to understand it, whether it's a literary thing or whether it really did it or what, that depends on one's level of materialism. And so at, the vision, at this vision of the magnificent miracle affected by the supernormal power of the Lord Buddha, the entire host was ecstatic, enraptured, astonished, delighted, satisfied, and filled with awe and pleasure. They all bowed down to the transcendent one, withdrew to one side with palms pressed together, and gazed upon him with fixed attention. And the young Lichavi Ratnakara, the leader of the 500 youths, <coughs> he knelt, <coughs> and he proclaimed a bunch of verses of praise, which are quite marvelous. Uh, about 15, 20 verses. And then he finally, uh, the last one is uh, worthy of reading. He says, you nullify all signs in all things everywhere. You are not subject to any wish for anything at all. The miraculous power of the Buddhas is inconceivable. I bow to you who stand nowhere like infinite space. So he seemed to have a good insight into what the nature of a Buddha was. <clears throat> because a Buddha is defined in the Mahayana as a being whose body is reality, that is to say, who is identified with all beings as if they were the same as himself, and not on some cosmic level of where all of us are unreal or something, and therefore we're all one when we're not there, <laughs> but we're all one when we're here, actually, which is a really weird, it's an inconceivability. In other words, as if you here in this room were sitting there, and instead of just looking out at the room from within your own set of sensory equipment, you suddenly felt you were everyone looking out of everyone's face in the whole room simultaneously. And you might be a little confused, which one are, am I really? But you know, you feel you're all of them. And yet you feel also you're the original one who previously was separated in your own skin. But now you both are that and you are everybody else. And that's how a Buddha is defined. Like if you've been really in love with someone, or a baby or something, you know, it doesn't have to be romantic, and you feel you are the other one, you know. Somehow you have that moments like that where you have slippage of identity, you know, where it encompasses more people. I'm sure everyone is familiar with that. <clears throat> so the Buddha is defined as a being with ultimate cosmic slippage of identity. But that's all, it's relative, of course, because all the beings are relative. But nevertheless, that's the definition. So that's what he means by you stand nowhere like infinite space. He's saying to someone who on some level is standing in front of him as a separated being, the, the Buddha in this case. So then, he then asks a question. All this is preliminary to these young people asking a question. And they say, uh, Bhagavan, Lord, these 500 young Lichavis are already truly on their way to unexcelled perfect enlightenment. That is, they've got the meditation bug, 
They've got the Dharma bug, and they want to become enlightened. Already, they want to do that. So they're, they're, that's where they start, in this case. And they have, but they have asked me, what is the Bodhisattva's perfection of the Buddha field? As I was translating it in those days. Nowadays, I call it a Buddha verse. So in other words, how do we perfect and purify the world? Now, we can talk about making ourselves enlightened, but how do we change the world, they're saying. Uh, please, Lord, explain to them the Bodhisattva's purification of the Buddha field, or perfection of the Buddha field. Which, that sounds right to you too, right? It sounds right to us. We can meditate and maybe we'll come to a deeper understanding of things, but how would that affect this whole huge mess? You know, how could we fix the world? You know? Because the Buddha world is defined again in the Mahayana. Since a bodhisattva, which you know, you know that word, means someone who vows not to become nirvana or enlightened until all beings have become free of suffering. So they don't want their own free, freedom from suffering until everyone else has it. Because it. Which means they do that because they have a sense of being interconnected with all the other beings to start with, so to speak. They don't think they can really finally be ultimately separate from them. So they make such a vow, and therefore when they become a Buddha, then they must transform the whole world with them, so that the other beings are going to be free of suffering. So, but this is a puzzle, how can you do that? Like, here we are suffering today in New York, 2,500 years after Buddha attained enlightenment. He was a bodhisattva. He said he wouldn't do it until we were all free from suffering. What? <laughs> Why'd he leave town? You know? Where'd he go? You know? So that, there, there's a puzzle there, of course. So the, then the Buddha says, good, good, young man, very good. Your question to the Tathagata, that is the one who has realized the nature of reality, named for Buddha, about the purification of the Buddha field is indeed good. Therefore, young man, listen well and remember, I will explain to you the perfection of the Buddha field of the Bodhisattvas. And so very good, Lord, he said. And then he starts to teach. He says, noble sons, a Buddha field of Bodhisattvas is a field of living beings. Why so? A bodhisattva embraces a Buddha field to the same extent that he causes the development of living beings. So in other words, he's saying that the world is not like a bunch of rocks and planets and stars and some sort of material thing. It is a realm of interconnected living beings. He doesn't say just the mind or something. He doesn't say matter doesn't exist. He just says a universe a Buddha, a Buddhaverse is a field of beings, that's all. We are an intersecting bunch of consciousnesses, you know? And that creates, that's, that is what the world is, that's what he's saying. And he goes on like that. And he also says it's impossible to create a Buddha field, but therefore Bodhisattvas created anyway. <laughs> and, uh, never mind, he says. But it's not possible, but they do it, even though it's not possible, so never mind. And then he goes on endless thing, like a just typical Bodhisattva's Buddha field is a field of generosity. When he attains enlightenment, living beings who give away all their possessions will be born in his Buddha field. It's a field of morality. When he attains enlightenment, living beings who follow the path of the ten virtues with positive thoughts will be born in his Buddha field. He goes on like that. So finally he ends up after a long spiel where he says, the purity of the Buddhaverse reflects the perfection of living beings. The perfection of the living beings reflects the purity of his intuitive wisdom. The purity of his intuitive wisdom reflects the purity of his teaching. The purity of his teaching reflects the purity of his transcendental practice. And the purity of his transcendental practice reflects the purity and the perfection meaning of his own mind. Thereupon, and poor Shariputra. Now Shariputra is the head monk of the individual liberation school, the one that feels that we can just ourselves personally attain nirvana if we work at it, and that's good because we'll no longer be harmful to others, but we don't necessarily have the power to bring others with us. So that's the, that's the uh, individual, I, I, don't, I never call it lesser vehicle, I call it uh, individual vehicle. So the individual is just seeking the individual thing as being more practical, they think. So, but he has a thought. He says, if the Buddha land is pure only to the extent that the mind of the Bodhisattva is pure or perfect, then when Shakyamuni Buddha was engaged in the career of the Bodhisattva, his mind must have been imperfect. Otherwise, how could this Buddha verse appear to be so imperfect? And isn't that, the, aren't we are like that now? We look around the world, it looks like a hopeless case, doesn't it? Even, it used to be America, at least we had 
somebody, we had a guy who could shoot hoops, <laughs> you know, and who was fairly decent to his wife, you know. Uh, but uh, now, you know, like whatever, you know, we're like the rest of them. So then Buddha, who, but then it's a magically influenced by the Buddha, poor Shariputra. He has a thought planted in his mind by his teacher. Then he, he, then he thinks it, he didn't even say it. Then Buddha reads his mind. It's so irritating. Mm -hmm. And then he says, what do you think, Shariputra? Is it because the sun and moon are impure that those blind from birth are, don't see them? And then Shariputra kind of knows what's coming and says, no, Lord, it is not so. The fault with the Lord is with those blind from birth and not with the sun and moon. And the Buddha says, in the same way, Shariputra, the fact that some living beings, like you, huh, do not behold the splendid display of the virtues of the Buddha verse of the Buddha is due to their own ignorance. It is not the fault of the Buddha. Shariputra, the Buddha verse of the Tathagata, the, the real, real, realized one, is pure, but you do not see it. And then the Brahma Shikin, that's, that's God, who is tip attending on the teaching. He says to the Venerable Shariputra, Reverend Shariputra, do not say that the Buddha field of the Buddha is impure. Reverend Shariputra, the Buddha field of the Buddha is pure. I see the splendid expanse of the Buddha verse of Lord Shakyamuni as equal to the splendor of the abodes of the highest deities, he says. So then the Shariputra holds his ground, however, and he says, she said to the Brahma Shikin, who became visible to make that statement, as for me, O Brahma, I see this great earth with its highs and lows, its thorns, its precipices, its peaks, and its abysses, as if it were entirely filled with excrement, he says. And Brahma Shikin replies, the fact that you see such a Buddha field as this, as if it were so imperfect, Reverend Shariputra, is a sure sign that there are highs and lows in your mind and that your positive thought in regard to the Buddha intuition is not pure either. Reverend Shariputra, those whose minds are impartial toward all living beings and whose positive thoughts toward the Buddha intuition, intuitive wisdom are pure, see this Buddha verse as perfectly pure. Thereupon the Lord touched, now this is the, what I wanted to really share with you. Thereupon the Lord touched the ground of this 